My name is Piers Ridyard, uh, and I am the CEO of Radix, and I have been in crypto since about 2015. Radix is based on a entirely new infrastructure um, that we've created. So the genesis of it came in 2011-2012 when Dan um, first discovered Bitcoin and um, what Dan likes to do is take things apart. So he forked the Bitcoin blockchain and he wanted to see how scalable it was and when it would break and found that you know after about 500 transactions per second if you removed all the block size limits you started to get block thrashing and the, the blockchain just sort of falls over. And he also found things like transaction mutability and a few other issues and he came back to the Bitcoin community and said, hey guys, I found all these problems, we should probably look at this. And you got this massive response being like, no, you're wrong, like this is the global currency of the future, this is going to be, this is going to solve everything. Um, and you know, all of these are small issues and they're easy to fix. So it was from there that he started trying to build a scalable alternative to the blockchain. That first went with block trees, found that that went to like 1,200 transactions per second, but there was still that bottleneck. And then he started looking at DAGs, and you know, that goes to about 7,000 transactions per second. But then there's still these bottlenecks, a different type of bottleneck with a DAG than with a block tree. And then he started looking at virtual voting and things like that, and realized that actually, what we're doing at the moment is we're taking a consensus mechanism, say proof of work and proof of stake, and an architecture, say blockchain or DAG, and we're trying to sort of like mash them together. Whereas what you need to build is a consensus mechanism and an architecture that are designed together. You can't have them separate and then try and push them together. You have to actually build it so that it can work massively at scale. And the only way to do that is by actually building your own architecture and consensus mechanism together. So that's what Radix is. It's not, it's not a DAG, it's not blockchain, it's not block trees. It's something called Tempo, which is a consensus mechanism and an architecture built together from the ground up. So the key features that will attract developers to build dApps on this new DLT fall into two categories. The first is the obvious one, which is, is it scalable? Are you going to be bottlenecked as a developer by the success of other people on a platform that everyone is sharing the throughput of, right? So if you've got Ethereum and everyone is sharing the throughput and you have something like CryptoKitties comes along and 100,000 concurrent users can stop your dApp from being able to service your customers because someone else is being successful and the platform doesn't scale, then that's a really important basis to be getting right just to begin with. Once you have the scalability problem out of the way and you can prove that no matter how many concurrent users are using your platform, you're not going to be ever in the position where you can't service your customers, the next thing is, well, how do you build on it? What is it that makes it easy for me as a developer to be successful on the Radix platform? And that comes down to the tool sets that, we've, that we're in the process of creating to allow developers to build their crypto vision. The first of these is we've kind of said, look, there's a number of basic tools that should just be available by default on a DLT. It shouldn't be something you need to write a smart contract for. It should be something that you can literally just ping an API and use natively on the platform. Those four things are send and receive a transaction, send and receive a message, because you can do instant messaging over Radix as well, multi-sig, and create tokens. And then all of those are encapsulated into our client libraries. So not only do we have the APIs, we're also building client libraries that allow developers to take the technology and put it into their tech stack as easily as possible without having to worry about how to, how to process a transaction or how to discreetly sign an atom or something like that. The next layer is once we have these basic tools, how do we create logic functions around them so that we can do some more interesting applications on top of the Radix protocol? Now this is what we call a Turing restricted environment. So it's an execution environment that isn't Turing complete, but provides a, a subset of logic tools that allow the developers to build without having to worry about things like formal verification, without having to worry too much that their, their application may not be secure. Because something like Solidity, as a really open architecture, allows you to build almost anything but it's really hard to know whether or not that thing you've built is secure. And with Radix, we've kind of gone, well, let, let's, let's layer this a bit more. Let's give some environments that 
mean people can pick up the logic tools really easily and build the applications they want to without having to worry too much about the security of it. And then the last layer is the Turing complete open execution environment that eventually will be on the Radix platform as well. But we're very much looking at that as the last bastion of complexity. You start with the simple, you start providing developers with really easy tools to build, and you let them accelerate to the point where they're suddenly getting to a level of expertise and complexity that their customers now really need that Turing complete environment. I don't think we're there yet for 90% of projects. The last thing we think is really important for developers and for the mass market is what we call real world bridges. So this ability for you to take something complex like crypto and make it easy for someone like your grandmother or your mother or someone to understand and be able to use. And one of these things is we've made the Radix ledger itself compatible with the cryptographic signatures that are produced by things like bank cards. So instead of needing to use Visa card or MasterCard or anything like that, instead of needing to use a centralized authority for things like identity, all of those things can be done directly against the Radix ledger, making it easy to build real world cryptographic solutions on top of the Radix platform. The Radix token has not been, the full details of it hasn't been released yet. We are in the process of finalizing our economics white paper, which will be released later on, probably quarter three um, of this year. But the basis of the Radix token that we're trying to achieve is low volatility. Not a pegged currency, not one-to-one -one with a dollar, but something that is low, low volatile enough for businesses to be able to make business decisions on the basis of the currency in a way where they can work out margins and they can be relatively sure that into the future that currency is going to be around the same value as it is today, which we think is absolutely critical to move it beyond just the realms of speculation and into the hands of people who actually need to use this for real world applications as well. The biggest challenge is knowing when to release, I suppose, or not releasing too early. You know, 2012, 20, 2013, we were doing block trees. 2013, 2014, we were doing directed acyclic graphs. You know, this is way before things like IOTA and Hashgraph and people like that started to use the, 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 the directed acyclic graph technology and then virtual voting. And each time that we went through that, we then tested it. We didn't release it to the wild or release a white paper. We actually built the technology and then stress tested it across a private network. And we found that in each time there was these flaws that meant that you would have to fundamentally rethink the architecture. And because it's immutable, once you put it out into the world, it's very difficult for you to go, no, we're absolutely changing everything. We're changing the architecture. We're changing the consensus mechanism. It becomes a new project. So instead of just releasing projects and then moving on to the next one, we wanted to keep working on it until we were absolutely sure that we could reach our end state goal, which was that every single person and every single device could use the network simultaneously. And that not just going to the market and being like, we've solved like, a little bit more scalability than, than everyone else at the moment. And just taking the money off the table for doing that. That's the most difficult aspect of a market like this is going to be enduring that can scale to every single person, every single device simultaneously. We won't be having um, an ICO in the traditional sense of the word because we are actually going to launch the technology first. There's not gonna be any RC20 or a placeholder saying an IOU for technology, right? There will be a platform that is launched in quarter four and that platform will then allow you to purchase tokens directly via our distributed exchange. And those tokens will be real Radix tokens that allow you to use the Radix platform in exactly the way intended. No promise of a technology delivery, delivery of technology first, and then the ability to use the platform as soon as you've purchased those tokens. For us, the, the most important thing to recognize as a protocol is that your success is the success of the people who build on your platform. Like, we are entirely focused on the fact that 
for us to be successful, the developers who build projects on us have to be successful. For us to be successful, it has to have real world utility to every single person that touches it. And so what I hope the Radix contribution to the long-term DLT industry is, is that this focus on making real projects with real value to real people will help to accelerate the adoption of crypto and DLT worldwide for every single person, not just the niche crypto hardcore guys, but everyone who, for whom this can represent a really truly, in some cases, life-changing value to them especially if you're looking at access to finance, especially if you're looking at microfinance, especially if you're looking at um, cross-border payments and like all of these kind of things that we take for granted. You know, this ability to have a bank account, this ability to buy insurance, this ability to purchase stocks and shares, or whatever it happens to be, to be able to plan for your financial future. I don't think that we talk about enough, actually, the, the reduction of barriers to entry to that ecosystem, to the digital economy, what that may actually mean for the furtherment of human society globally.